A quote from Ray Dalio. Is AI going to drive inequality? Yes. There's going to be some winners and a bunch of losers. This is Ray Dalio on AI, robotics, and society's impact from AI. He's a legend in this game, so this is one you have to check out. AI is a bit of an alien that seems to have entered the room and has, is going to change almost every industry. Great. Yeah. I can't tell if you're being sarcastic. No. Truly. If you are working with it, controlling it, if it's a good partner to be able to get a lot of leverage, it's truly fantastic. As I said, in almost everything I did, we had the crit criteria, we had the systemized, how does reality work, what are the principles? And so it's a fantastic leveraging. Like I described, I would make the decision-making model, like the computer chess game that would make it. Well, now it's better than ever, those resources. Well, so it leverages you enormously. What about having a strong middle? We talked about having the strong sort of economic political middle. Is it going to drive inequality? Yes, it's person? going. To, that's the, like all good, like all things. It's going to be. It has good things and bad things. I think in managing and knowing what people are like and how they're all, it's going to be very valuable. Mostly very valuable. In terms of changing, there'll be a limited number of winners and a bunch of losers, and I think it's going to create much greater polarity, which as we're seeing through the system, the ways that we talked about, you know, that top one to 10% benefiting a lot. And then, yeah, so that will be a dividing force, I think. So I've got to pose the question with robotics accelerating at the speed of light with Optimus and Tesla and all the things they're doing and all these other companies, humanoid robots, and then with artificial intelligence, having trillions of dollars plowed into it and accelerating. We're in this crazy boom at the moment. With these two things combining, you're going to be able to have a humanoid robot that can navigate human spaces, but is also smarter than I am. Lawyers, accountants, lots of people in the medical profession. Why would you, why would one need them if we had a humanoid robot that is smarter than all of us and has a PhD and everything? Well, we will not need a lot of those jobs for the reasons that you're saying, okay. And then the question is what our society does. And what do you think we do in such a world? I think we fight over what we do, unfortunately, but I don't think we have escaped a world where most people, to have a healthy society, most people have to be productive and prosperous. I think people need to be, now certainly, there certainly needs to be a redistribution policy. I don't think that's just a redistribution of money policy because uselessness and money may not be a great combination. So I think that you have, that has to be figured out. And the question is whether we're too fragmented to figure that out and agree on it. And I'm worried about that. Is there any historical precedence for this in your view? someone that knows history? Is there any historical precedence for something like AI and robotics converging? Well, through evolution, we have gone from a period of time, which was called the dark ages or the agricultural age, in which basically there was land, it's agricultural and so on. And people were treated, they were essentially like oxen, most people. And then there were the landowners who were the nobles, and then there were the royalty who were the families that control most things and so on. And then in history, with the invention of the printing press, there became more knowledge, more intelligence, and we see an evolution in which you start to see new ages emerge and thinking emerge and power change. And I won't take you through the whole history, but you start to see that individuals can be clever enough to earn money. So you begin the age of exploration and the industrial revolutions in which machines replaced people. And it's almost like they first replaced them physically. That, in other words, they didn't have, they were not like oxen doing the thing. So you get a tractor or something. And, it, and it's almost like from the body up in terms of the mind. And so you've seen 
that evolution through time and the rise of intelligence in its various forms go through this arc of rising in intelligence. And now you see that intelligence matters more than anything. It matters more than money. It matters more than anything because intelligence will attract people, those with money, to invest in the, in the development of that. And so we have seen this arc through history develop in that way, right? And we've seen people replaced. Now, the question is, as we get higher and higher in thinking, whether we're just going to be totally replaced. Our muscles have been totally replaced. But as this is happening, our best thinking may be totally replaced. And we're going to have to deal with that question. Are you hopeful? I'm excited. I'm, I think it all comes down to human nature. I'm excited in that fast forward, make the most of it, jump on it. Woo! You know, I'm excited. I've also watched the evolution of species. Almost all species have come and gone for certain reasons. And one of the reasons that they have come and gone is because their strengths are not in all respects great strengths. You can use these things, intelligence, to your detriment. And I believe that the things that these technologies and so on bring us, while very important, it extends life expectancy and all of that, is not import as important as human nature. And so if you were to go back in time or at different societies, do you have happier societies? Is the well-being greater? Okay, so you can go 50 years ago and you might say the well-being is greater 50 years ago. Not in all ways the technologies and the consequences of those are much better, but you may have had a better life and it's human nature of how people are going to deal with each other. So I think the real question is, can people rise above this? And, and which it goes back to the spirituality question. Can people then rise above it so that they think of the collective good and they think of, you know, collectively, how do we make the best? And also karma, in other words, the realization that if I help you in ways that can be so simple for me to help you and make such a big difference in your life and you do the same and we have win-win relationships, it'll be good. But if we don't do that, and I worry about human nature and I worry about this process. Especially when you've got geopolitical tensions. and It's because of human nature. I've had a lot of conversations on the podcast about AI and I just can't seem to get to my own solid conclusion about this because when I look at human nature, as you say, I see greed, I see power, hunger, status. Some problems just accept the fact that you may not be able to be confident about a prediction in the future, so it'll always be a question, and just get on with the fact of using it for yourself in the best way that works for you. That's what I'm doing. Hans, Ray draws a historical parallel to the printing press and industrial revolutions where machines replaced physical labor. Do you see AI's impact as a natural continuation of this trend, or is it fundamentally different this time? I think the answer to your question is actually yes and no. This is a continuation of trends that have been going on for a long time where we are expanding the knowledge of humanity and we're expanding the access to knowledge. And then we're also automating more and more physical tasks. But we also need to remember that there is a point where a difference in quantity becomes a difference in kind and I think that that is the precipice that we're actually crossing over, that there is an inflection point that we are experiencing right now with the development of artificial intelligence and then the implications that that has with robotics that mean that this really is a much different thing. You know, Ray Dalio's mental model for this, where he talks about the fact that we've been able to automate labor and that we no longer use our human muscles to do many things in you know many ways that is actually true but when you step back and you think about it the areas where that is true are areas where the same types of things need to be done over and over again in a repetitive way and so we've 
managed to automate a lot of farming that, you know, used to be well over 90% of all human labor just went into making food. And now if you know even one out of 10 people who's a farmer, you're a special person because they are not 10% of the population even. But we've also been able to mechanize a lot of other areas of the economy as well. Sometimes that has to do with construction. Sometimes that has to do with transportation. Sometimes that has to do with earth moving. But there are lots of ways that we have actually created incredible machines that can do the labor that used to take an army of people to do. And as we've mechanized so many parts of the economy, the economy has actually grown. The less time that we have to spend farming is more time that we can do other things that we find more valuable, more productive, or more rewarding. But all of that that has happened over the last several hundred years has happened in a pre-AI context. And now people are wondering, hey, if we really are going to be able to build artificial general intelligence or artificial super intelligence, these machines that can think as well as humans do, are they going to be able to do all of the economic things that we can do? Are they going to take all of our jobs? And it really is a very difficult question to answer in a number of ways. One obvious conclusion that I would agree with is that yes, artificial intelligence is going to unlock all sorts of applications for robotics that have just been too hard. That while we have been able to automate lots of physical jobs that are very consistent and they are very repetitive, there are lots of different physical jobs that have even just a slight amount of variation in them that makes that automation very, very difficult. And artificial intelligence is much more flexible in the way that it is programmed and the way that it operates and the way that it interacts with the world. And that flexibility is key to actually making robotics something that can be generally useful, that you can actually get more useful work out of than it takes to put into it in order to actually get it to work and do what it is that you want it to do. And so I am expecting an explosion of applications where Artificial intelligence plus robotics, whether that's in the humanoid form factor or a variety of other form factors like robotaxis, for example, there are going to be lots and lots of jobs that humans are used to doing that are going to actually be moved over to AI and robotics. And humanoid robotics in particular is going to be a very big sector of the economy because there are so many tools and so many jobs that we have specifically tailored to be done by humans already. And so having a robot that is the size and shape and has the dexterity and the capabilities and the strengths that the human form factor has just unlocks a tremendous addressable market for robotics. But then to circle back to the question of what does that mean for human jobs? Do they actually go away in mass? I think that's a more difficult question to answer. That even though there will be lots of jobs that get automated, both in the knowledge work sphere and in the physical world, doesn't mean that new jobs aren't created or that the person who was doing that job actually still has their job. It's just a portion of the tasks that they were responsible for actually get reallocated. And so while this is kind of a hot topic and you hear lots of fear and doubt being spread by AI researchers of all sorts of stripes, I would also like to steel man the opposing argument that is set forth by people like Jensen Wong and Alex Karp and Jonathan Ross, who really all disagree. Um, in fact, Jonathan Ross in his recent interview said that he thinks that we're going to actually have a human labor shortage, that getting people to actually participate in the labor that needs to be done is actually going to be more difficult because they are, A, going to be in higher demand because there are so many more businesses that are competing for that labor, and then B, because people will actually become significantly more wealthy in real terms as prices of goods and services drop due to deflation driven by the productivity that comes on the back of all of this automation. And so as it becomes easier and easier for them to have their needs met, they reach the point which that marginal hour of extra work really isn't worth it to them. And they 
prefer actually to do more rewarding leisure activities. And then when we look at companies like NVIDIA or Palantir, we know that Jensen Huang and Alex Karp aren't cutting headcount. They're actually continuing to hire and they're growing the productivity of their companies faster than they're hiring headcount, which then makes it easier to make that incremental next hire as well because you know that it's more than worth it. So we at least have some good counter examples to the classic fear and doubt that is being spread about how everyone is going to lose their jobs from very important companies that are right on the bleeding edge of this technology and the tip of the spear for these changes that are going to be made. And in all of this, let's not forget Thomas Sowell's definition of what economics actually is. He says, it is the allocation of scarce resources that have alternative uses. And in a world where much of the physical labor and knowledge work is actually automatable, what is it that actually becomes scarce? Well, as the marginal cost of compute and intelligence goes to zero and the supply effectively goes to infinity, then one of the things that does remain scarce is actually human time, human labor, and human effort. Especially when you factor in current birth rates and projections of declining populations in many major countries. Ray mentions geopolitical tensions as a risk factor with AI's rise. How do you think AI could influence the changing of the world order, which is a big topic Ray often discusses, especially in the US-China dynamics as global power shifts? Well, AI is undoubtedly going to play an enormous role in the changing of the world order. And just to give people a brief synopsis of Ray Dalio's overall point on this, he has studied many different risings and fallings of empires in what he would call world orders over the course of many thousands of years of human history. And right now we have been in a period where all of the metrics that he tracks really seem to indicate that the U.S.-led world order that we have been living in for the past several decades is on the decline. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is over, but it's not trending in the right direction. And at the same time, we do see the rising power of China on the world stage. And so this has the potential to set up for major conflict between the United States and China that could actually lead to the end of the U.S.-led global world order and the beginning of something completely and utterly new. So if we actually want to think about how AI is going to impact the potential changes in this global world order, it's obviously going to be a very complex and nuanced discussion. But at a high level, I think there are at least two major areas that the United States needs to focus on in order to maintain a healthy position within the new multipolar geopolitical landscape. It is inevitable that AI is going to be a big component of this arms race between the United States and China, and that arms race is going to be fought primarily as both a military arms race and then also an economic arms race. And really that economic arms race is the more important of the two overall. And that's why we've been hearing so much about industrial policy and AI from both Washington DC and Silicon Valley over the past few years. And so we have people like David Sachs in the Trump administration, who's really the tip of the spear on trying to get our industrial policy correct on this. And then you're also hearing these themes from a number of the MAG7 CEOs like Elon Musk, Jensen Wong, Sundar Pichai, Mark Zuckerberg, Satya Nadella, and then even a number of other large companies here in the United States like Alex Karp with Palantir or Palmer Lucky with Anduril. But then even in the startup community, venture firms like A16Z with Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz have really been driving forward on a theme of American dynamism and trying to combine AI with real world manufacturing and supply chain here in the United States and abroad with our allies in an effort to be able to maintain our ability to defend and promote Western values around the world. Before we wrap, I have to say a huge thank you to my co-host, David. Besides being a great co-host with a great accent, David has been one of the key figures behind the scenes helping me to grow this channel from 1,000 to over 16,000 subscribers and to put out regular shows that reach millions of views every year. When he's not moonlighting with me, he usually works with businesses who want to leverage YouTube to grow their online presence and he's looking to take on more. 
If you want to get more clients and more brand awareness for your business using YouTube, I definitely recommend him. You can book a free call with him using the link in the description below.